What's up, guys? Welcome back to the weekly Scraps Hadouken. Episode 219, we just had a wrap-up of UFC Vegas 69? 69. Ooh, 69. <laughs> I make myself laugh. What can I say? Uh, really good fight, especially the main event. And I, I heard some people saying online, which always tends to be true, that the cards that people don't tend to know, like in terms of name value, always tends to be the ones that have the most fun, electrifying fights, knockouts, finishes, all that good stuff. And that's what people are tuning in to see because they want to see the good stuff, you know? Especially me. Um, Big shout out to our guy, Nassim Sadikov, straight from Azerbaijan. But I think he grew up in Russia, if I'm not mistaken. Um, grew up in Azerbaijan, then they moved to Russia. Now he lives in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, came out here to stay with me in my house in Vegas, getting himself ready and getting acclimated. Big shout out to Big Body Steamroller, Matt Frivola, for coming out here and doing the deed, helping out Nassim as much as he could to get him ready for this fight during this fight week, helping him with the weight cut, helping with the training just to keep him dialed in and help him lose the weight. And shout out to Charlie, uh, Charlie Campbell for coming out here as well, a.k.a. The Horse. I can't tell you why they call him The Horse. You're going to have to ask him that yourself. Uh, and don't ask me how I know, because I actually don't know. I'm just... I'm just talking crap right now. I actually don't know why they call him the horse. I just it's been kind of a running joke kind of thing. The horse. Um, but great fight. We're gonna start right away, guys. The main event. Really fun fight. This was a contrast of styles. We thought Andraj could come in, being that she had way more experiences, been in the five round fights, um, fought for a world title, has been a former champion herself which is not easy to do. Only a select few amount of people that step inside the octagon can actually become a UFC champion. Everyone believes they can be. But if you just look at the odds, you look at the numbers, you see how many fights people tend to have, a couple of unlucky decisions and calls and things like that, um, early stoppages, talk to stoppage. Sometimes it's tough to realize that dream, and sometimes it's just not in your cards. And for a, a woman like Jessica Andrade, to come out and get it done. I hope I'm saying her name right. Jessica Andrade. Uh, getting it done. Becoming a world champion. Now what I would call passing of the torch to the now 11-1 and Aaron Blanchfield. And I had some questions coming into this. I love jiu-jitsu. I love grappling. I think Aaron Blanchfield is one of the highest level of grapplers in the female division. Bar none. Um, I mean, there's some standout wrestlers, kind of like Tatiana Suarez. She hasn't competed in a while. Actually competes this week, which is actually nice. I think a three- or four-year layoff, man, since her injuries, like back-to-back -back injuries. Um, then you got some other females that have some um, solid grappling as well. Caitlin Chukagan, black belt under Henzo Gracie. Um, so you, 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 I, I believe under the Henzo Gracie lineage, let me not misspeak, I think she was training with Ricardo Almeida for, for a bit, so... Um, with that being said, I think Blanchfield is kind of one of those athletes that stands out in that women's division, and I think she's going to give a lot of people problems. Her striking was the main concern for me, but she came out, checked off those those boxes and showed that I can strike. Um, the fight before that that she had, I wasn't too sold that the striking was going to be so great against Molly McCann. Is it Molly McCann? I feel like it was somebody else. Maybe it was Aldridge um, or McCann. Maybe it was McCann when in some of the striking exchanges, just the reaction to the defense. But then she comes out and she's poised. She's rolling with the punches. Um, anything that Andrade was throwing big, she kind of absorbed it and kind of turned, which is rolling with the punches. So I'm saying the same thing twice. Uh, I think she did a relatively great job in showing improvement in that department, showing that she's not frantic. There was only one moment where Andrade put on a blitz. It was like at the two minute and 20 second mark of the first round. She started to charge and do her classic Jessica Andrade slash Vandalay Silva left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right combination and caught um, Blanchfield against the case. She tied her up and was able to reset, get back to the middle. With that being said, that was the only little blip I saw. And it happens. Sometimes you get caught off guard and sometimes you get 
pressured in a, in, a, in a situation where you don't react as best as you possibly can. And that's what we're striving to do. We're striving for perfection as close as we can get to it as fighters. So shout out to her, man. She landed some beautiful shots in that first round. And watching the cage side, I had the stupid pole in my way. It seemed like Andrade was doing better with the striking. But then when I watched it back, I was like, man, a lot of those shots didn't land the way I thought they were landing. Other, other than the one that was like an uppercut and an overhand over the top that Andrade landed. And Blanchville, she ate that one. And she kind of recognized it and came back and landed some more stuff. But she was so spot on with her. One, two, sliding backwards and hitting her jab. And then, yeah, she went for the takedown the first round. Andrade did a great job of defending it. But then in the second round, when Jessica Andrade pushed forward, Blanchfield was able to tie her up. And when she tied her up, over under situation, and hits a beautiful inside leg trip. Takes her down and immediately passes the guard to half guard and right into side control. She steps over with the right leg. Mule kicks over the top, passes the knee line of Andrade, passes over, settles position, and Andrade is kind of just hanging out. And I'm in my head like, did she not think she was going to get taken down? Or is she kind of like, in her head, maybe she's thinking, if I did get taken down, that was pretty much the fight. So, as soon as she turned, she turned to all fours, which is one of the worst ways you could stand up to get up. Like, of course, you got to stand up to a certain degree, but she was holding on to Blanchfield's head. She turned to all fours, let go of the head, and as she put both hands on the mat, both knees were on the mat, Blanchfield was able to go seatbelt, and from the seatbelt control, she was covering the choking hand, and that right hand slipped right under her neck. She locked in the rear naked choke before she even put hooks in. Put the right hook, the left hook in first, then put the back hook in last, and then flattened her out, finished the fight, and got the submission, got the tap. High level stuff. And I do think she is a potential. I think she can give Valentina Shevchenko a run for her money. If not, beat Valentina Shevchenko. I think the one little blip that we saw with. Shevchenko was when she got taken down by Jennifer Maya and the whole world went crazy. Oh, my gosh. We never seen Shevchenko like this before. Ah. But now we got Blanchfield, who's actually a real high-level specialist with her grappling. And she can finish from multiple positions. We've seen the standing guillotine against the cage. We've seen the Kimura lock. Damn near took the arm and put it in the suitcase and sent it back to England um, for McCann over to the Scousers in Liverpool. And now Jessica Andrade, she chokes her out. Former world champion. So what's to say if Shevchenko can't get past Grasso? I believe it's Grasso she's fighting. Let me just double check to make sure because I don't want to be talking out of my ass. But I do believe she's fighting Alexa Grasso, who is not a... I think she's got great striking, but she's not the best grappler from what I've seen in terms of like submission, maybe like defensively. So this makes me have a lot of high hopes for her to potentially go out there and dethrone the, the reigning defending champion that's been on top of the throne for a very, very long time, only losing to the likes of Amanda Nunes of, of recent memory. You know what I mean? So when you see that type of dominance and then you see a, a contender like Blanchfield, who's only, how old is she again? 23 years old. That is promising stuff. And I think I could, I'm going to call this now. People are going to say I'm crazy. She's unproven versus guys. A fight is a fight. We've seen with Volkanovsky and Islam. If you do the proper work, which Blanchfield did coming in here, making the adjustments to fight a girl like Jessica Andrade, a big difference from who she was supposed to fight in Talia Santos in style, right or wrong. So when you see that she can make that adjustment and deal with the barrage striking, of Jessica Andrade, what makes you think she can't make the same type of adjustments going into the fight with Valentina Shevchenko? We know Shevchenko's got a sick right hook, check right hook that she catches everybody with, a nasty inside leg kick, and she takes you down. She's very good on top. She's got good body locks. But can she do that to a, a lady like Blanchfield, who's very well versed in the grappling? If she goes in the clinch, Blanchfield seems to be very comfortable there. And we see that she can now strike and she's very good and responsible with her defense. You see a lot of high-level strikers, guys. They can strike, 
But then their defensive responsibility is like, yo, you could be the hammer all you want, but when you're the nail, when people are pouring on the offense, how good is your defense to keep you in the fight so that you don't get knocked out, so you don't get rocked, and so you don't absorb too much damage that can now change the direction of the fight? Because we all know you can strike. Everyone's got two hands, feet, elbows, knees, for the most part. So you could go out there and fight the perfect fight, but if you're not doing the right things defensively, it could be a very short night for you. And that's kind of where I'm going with this. And I, I'm going to say I like the odds for Blanchfield coming into the fight with Shevchenko. Obviously, Shevchenko has to be Grasso first. That's first and foremost. But if she doesn't, I think Blanchfield, guys, and I'm not shitting on, I don't have any hate against Kyrgyzstan people now. I, I like watching Valentina fight. Don't get me wrong. But when it comes to grappling, the one vulnerability that we did see, Blanchfield's got that. Now with the striking, can Valentina keep it upright the entire time like Shevchenko, like uh, Andrade was able to do in the first round? Now you got to do that for five. I, I just like this matchup. It's a classic striker versus grappler. And for me, I think the grappler tends to win. It's kind of like Islam versus Olive, not even Oliveira. Islam versus... Let's say if he fought Gaethje, most people are going to side Khabib versus Gaethje. Most people are going to side with the grappler because you got the one shot to land that haymaker, and if you don't land that haymaker, you get taken out. It's going to be a long night. What's the difference between this? And that's me giving praise to Khabib, guys, if you can't connect the two dots because people are crazy. So, again, I think if they do have this matchup, I think Blanchfield comes in as the underdog, and if I were a betting man, which I don't bet, I would actually put money on Blanchfield coming into that because I think she has a very good chance and a great style that shows a lot of promise and upside. Being that young, showing the amount of improvement she's made per fight that she can get it done. And versatility on the ground. Not just I can only choke you if I get to the back control. She can submit you standing. She can submit you from top position. She can submit you if she gets your back. That's very dangerous. Congrats again to Erin Blanchfield. And I look forward to seeing what she does in the future because... 23 years young, she's got the world by, I don't want to say the balls, but she got the world by the the bosoms. The PG-13, right? <laughs> um, Big shout out to our guy in the scene, the Sadikov. I just want to give a shout out to him again. Uh, for Evelyn, let me make sure I'm saying his name right, because <laughs> I don't want to botch that. Um, Evan Elder. Tough fight, back and forth first round. He got clipped in the first round, but it bounced right back up. Quick flash knockdown, got back up, got in the guy's face. Very close round. I gave the round to Evan because I knew that's how the, the judges typically score the fight. If you get knocked down and the striking is close, they typically give it to the guy who got the knockdown. Okay. Um, they come back in the second round. Nas starts to pick it up. He gets taken down. He gets a takedown of his own. Um, and watching the case side, I felt like Elder was doing better than what he actually was. When you go back and you watch it on the TV, you can actually see that it was a lot closer than what I thought. But still, even watching on TV, I still felt that the urgency would have still been on the side of Nassim to go out there in the third round and put a stamp on it. And that's what he did. Went out there, put a stamp in that third round and got it done. We, uh, Matt, and, Matt and I, Ray and I were telling him to go to the body, uh, come up under the middle, look for those shots underneath. And because uh, every time he kept ducking his head, he fought a beautiful fight. He made a a big adjustment from his um, UFC debut against I think I think um, Parsons or something like that. And he looked way better. Obviously, he fought up a weight class. Now coming down to his proper weight class at 155, this was a great dance partner for um, Nas and for him to show the world what he's capable of. And I know he was kind of down about it and saying like he didn't want to show any vulnerability whatsoever. But I think this goes to show you that. The world now sees that this is a guy who's not going to go away and you're going to need the kitchen sink to put him to get him out of there kind of thing. You know, so seeing that, uh, I think he showed a lot of great striking versatility, uh, show that he's dangerous. If you get in close with the knees, with the elbows and even with his kicks, landed a nice head kick that normally I think would have put a lot of people down. All the tough kept kept coming forward. But eventually Nas landed a beautiful knee off the break right on the eye. Nasty cut. The ref was looking at it. You could see him stepping in and taking a good look at the cut. It's called time. The doctor came and looked at it, and they called the fight. TKO, first UFC fight with a finish, and what other 
what other better way can you ask to start your UFC career? You know what I mean? So congrats again to Nas and congrats to Elder as well because he, he showed a lot of grit, showed that he is a tough out for anybody. And I think he's got a promising future as well. Now 0-2 in his UFC career. But sometimes your record doesn't actually reflect how good of a fighter you actually are. Um, so Saturday night belonged to Nas. Uh, Elder will have his night, I believe, in the UFC at one point or the other. And uh, I look forward to seeing more. And I think the world's going to look forward to seeing more and seeing out, out there and seeing what his ceiling is and what his capabilities are. And I think the sky's the limit. He shows great wrestling, um, IQ, uh, a willingness to learn, very explosive, dynamic striking. And I think that's the recipe that you need um, for success. So, you know, watch this fight. Um, take some notes, see what you can improve on, and see how you can get better. And that's that's what it's all about. Not getting comfortable with getting a win. And even when you win, you can still take lessons to improve and get better. And uh, I think just us coming back home right from the fight and watching it all together and uh, everyone kind of giving in their input shows uh, how much he wants it, you know? So I, I think he's going to be a main staple for his country of Azerbaijan. I think a lot of people are going to be excited to see him and his future upcoming fights in the UFC. So make sure you guys tune in and watch that guy and go follow him on Instagram, on the gram. Um, other than that, there were some other really good fights. I'm not going to go into all these right now because I got a couple other things I want to talk about. And it's getting late here on the West Coast. And I got to get ready for my first day back training since, I mean, I sparred with Marab like two weeks, three weeks ago now at this point. But I was kind of coming off the couch and it wasn't very good. I just wanted to try to give him as best of a look as I could. And surprisingly, I was able to go th three rounds and not really training at all. Other than I was running like here and there, like once, maybe twice a week. Um, getting on the bike once, maybe twice a week. Like together between the bike or running, that was all I was doing. So to be able to give him a hard three rounds and then him finishing up with two other people, um, I was happy about that. But that was the last time I actually got to do an MMA workout. So I'm excited tomorrow, start of the week, President's Day, I will be back on the mat training, preparing. And yes, you guys guessed it. I'm telling you this right now. Breaking news. Straight out of Boost Mobile, unlimited talking text. Tell them I sent you. There's no promo code for these guys or anything like that. Um, but I will say, I'm fighting May 6th against Henry Ciudo. I'm looking forward to the challenge. Again, I think Henry's a very tough dude, very accomplished in the wrestling world. I think also in the MMA world. Uh, he's had his ups and downs the same way I have, and he's shown the ability to bounce back, and I think that's what makes us very, very similar, that wrestling grit, that wrestling mentality, and how to keep improving, how to keep growing, and how to keep learning. And with that being said, always being a, a seeker of knowledge. Um, I think he's a little strange outside of that. Um, you can look past that. You can see that he's a tough competitor, and he's in there to win every single time he makes the walk. And I'm going to be doing... The absolute same thing. And I can't wait for this matchup because I think it's two guys that won't back down. And I think the wrestling might cancel each other out. Might. We will see. If I'm able to actually ragdoll him, we're going to figure out in the first first five minutes. And then from there, we'll figure out if we want to waste a ton of energy grappling or do we want to put these to the test and show the world what high-level grapplers can actually do when it comes to striking. I know you guys were impressed with Usman versus Kobe Covington. That was a striker's delight. And I would not be surprised if this fight is exactly the same way. So I'm looking forward to this matchup. Henry, I cannot wait for the challenge to fight you. And I know and I hope you can't wait to fight me as well. Um, the crowd deserves a big fight. This is a big fight for the Bantamweight division. The best division in the entire UFC and across the world, in my personal opinion. Um, anyone in ranked in the top 15 could be a potential UFC champion. And outside of that, there's killers that aren't ranked right now. You know, So... I'm happy that I'm sitting on top of the throne. I know you're happy that you've been once on top of this throne. And let's get to let's go out there and show the world some magic and, and make some good things happen and make this one for the history book. So I'm looking forward to the challenge. Um, I don't give a shit about the cringe and all that. I'm taking you very, very seriously. And I cannot wait to put my shin across your head and show you that you're good, but you're just not on my level. I know you can say whatever you want to say, my wrestling and talk about my striking and all this, I mean, if you analyze all my fights the right way, you'll see that that's a very, very big mistake to overlook me in that site. But maybe you're just playing mind games. 
but ain't no mind games here. I know what you're good at. I know you're good in the grappling, clinch work, and things like that. Uh, I think my range is going to be a problem. I think you're tough. I think you're durable. You show that in the Maul and Marais fights. Um, but I just think I have more ways to win, and I think that's going to be the difference in this fight. So I'm looking forward to the matchup, and I can't wait to show the world that and still, Aljamain Sterling is still the best damn band weight on this planet. So make sure you guys tune in for that. It's going to be a huge fight. And uh, this is what... This is what legacy is made of. You know, I go out there, I beat a guy like that. Um, I think it removes any possible doubt in the world, even though I think it's stupid. to. I've got the most top five wins out of any band and weight in this entire division that is currently active. I have the most top five wins. So for anyone to try to discredit me and say whatever they want to say, guess what? The joke's on you. Because at the end of the day, the history books will tell my story and at the end of the day, I will forever be known as a UFC champion. Call the DQ and acting whatever you want. Okay, cool. Acted. And guess what? I came back, redeemed myself, and guess where I'm at now. So it's not my fault TJ tore his arm. I fought with a torn labor myself. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. And that's the way the fight game goes. I can only deal with what they put in front of me. And I was getting ready for the toughest TJ Dillashaw out there looking to become a three-time champion. He might have overlooked my striking ability and my grappling ability. And guess what? Sometimes the fight doesn't go your way. I've been knocked out by Marlon Marais. I came back dusting myself off. I didn't make excuses. I said I dived into his knee. I made a miscalculation. Marvin, Marlon Marais capitalized on it. And that's what the fight game is made about. Take your wins and your losses. Learn from it. Get better. And come back stronger as best as you can. So I'm looking forward to the challenge. And again, this is a fight for legacy. The most top five wins in Bantamweight history. For this guy, going to be taking on a guy who cut the line in Henry Cejudo to get a title shot. And rightfully so, I'm not saying he didn't deserve it, but he cut the line. And he didn't get to go through the gauntlet of 135ers like I did. And I think that's going to be the difference. I think I'm more battle-tested. I'm going to be the bigger man in there. I think I got the grappling advantage. If he takes me down, what's he going to do? I'm going to slice him up and butcher him with elbows from the bottom to the point where he wants to just get up. Um, and I'm going to force him to want to stand. And when he stands, I'm going to be looking to put knees and elbows in front of his face the entire fight. And I guarantee you we'll see who's going to break first. And uh, I think the reason why Henry doesn't want to grapple is because he is afraid of getting tired from the constant grappling with the bigger guy. And I guarantee you I'm going to prove that. So, again, this may be a strike of the light, but there's going to be some wrestling in there. So make no mistake about it. I'm not going to stay away from my bread and butter. I'm going in there to win at all costs. And if Henry's wrestling is as good as he says it is, he'll be able to keep the fight standing and turn it into a striking match as much as he would like to see that happen. So if that's what you think your best chances are of winning, prove it. Make it happen, and we'll see who gets their hand raised on the night. I look forward to seeing you on May 6th. Make sure you guys tune in because the Funk Master is here to stay. Ooh, that just got me fired up. Oh, man. All right. So next up, um, people are asking me, uh, would I still go up to 145? And the question is absolutely. Now, I'm going to be real with you guys. Did Volkanovski going against Islam scare me a bit? Yeah, that got me nervous. It got me saying, oh, man, this guy is really freaking good. Going up and taking on the supposedly Khabib 2.0 and doing that to him, ending the fight in that way, um, defending chokes and punching him while he's got this insane Dagestani um, killer wrestler on his back and he's beating him up from an undominant position. Yeah, that's a tough fight. How can that not scare anybody? But that's what this game is about. I like the challenge. I like what Volk was able to show in there. But again, I like my chances. And this is what the fight game is all about. Taking risks and taking chances. Because if you don't risk it, there's, there's no biscuit. You know what I mean? And that might sound cheesy to you guys, but that's really what it is. Um, it's a cliche line. Uh, but that's the best way I could put it. You got to be willing to put it all on the line in order to achieve greatness. In order to reach new heights in your career and in your life. Challenges make tougher and stronger men, when you want to be comfortable doing what you're doing over and over and over. Guys, I'm 14 and 3 in the UFC. I've won 14 Bantamweight fights. I'm tied for most Bantamweight wins, even though the Hen and Burrell fight didn't count because it was a catchweight at 140 because of the commission. Think about that. I've been doing this over and over and over. So if I want to go up and challenge myself, let me go up there and challenge myself. But first, obviously, I got to get past Henry Cejudo before I can even throw my name in that hat to go out there and uh, 
push for a double champ type of accomplishment. But uh, I'm excited for it, man. Volk looked like a monster. Uh, the points where Makachev was able to get him down, I think I do some things a little bit better than Makachev there. And I think that could be the difference. And guys, you can say whatever you want. Oh, you don't finish back. You only hug backs. Guys, I could argue that Makachev held Volkanovski's back longer than I did against Piotr Jan and did less in terms of striking damage and in terms of actual submission attempts. Don't say I'm a hater. Go watch the fight and compare both the fights and tell me what you think. And uh, I guarantee you'll be pleasantly surprised. So if I'm a back hugger, I don't know what the hell Islam is. So is that your king? And all of a sudden, I'm, if I'm the clown and he's the king, uh, you guys are delusional. Um, again, for Volkanovski to do that against him, I think I do a couple of things different. If I were to grapple with Islam, Islam beats me. But I think I can make it competitive. And I think if I get to a dominant position like the back control, I think I can give him some trouble. And that's just with anybody. I roll with bigger guys all the time. Not saying I beat him, but I think I could give him some trouble in those positions. Of course, I think if it was a 10-minute match or whatever jiu-jitsu match, Islam would probably win control me. He's way stronger, way bigger. Guys, I'm not delusional. I'm just talking skill for skill. I think I do some things a little bit more technically um, proficient than Makachev did where I think I can capitalize on Volkanovski in those positions. Um and the other side, I, I do think there's a couple things. Now, I know that that whole take I did kind of got like a lot of like split decisions because it seemed like most of the people were saying like they agree. And then a lot of people who seem to be from that region were saying that, no, we're being racist or we're being haters. We're not racist. We're not haters. At least I'm not. I can only speak for myself. Uh, but looking at the Vulcan Islam fight, going back and watching that again, there's a couple of things I took away. And I want you guys to let me know what you think. Either Volkanovski is really damn good and we did not give him the love and the flowers that he deserves. Either Volkanovski did his homework and really showed some great improvement that if you do your proper homework, you could stay in the fight and potentially win, which a lot of people still think he won the fight. I think Islam won, but not by much. Um, at best, a at worst, a draw, I would say. Um... That's how close the fight was. Or Islam Makachev was having an off night. Or Makachev isn't the Khabib 2.0 that we thought he was going to be. And maybe Khabib is just that much better than everybody in the entire world in terms of the grappling proficiency. Or five, not even five. So if it's, if it's one of those four things, now we throw in a fifth thing and I would go, is it possible, now that we've seen that match play out, that maybe Charles Oliveira wasn't the best version of Charles Oliveira against one of the better or best versions of Islam Makachev that night? And guys, that happens. Sometimes guys have an off night and they choose not to talk about it. Because when people ask, they go, oh, you're making an excuse. But these things are real. Sometimes you go to work and you shit the bed because guess what? You had an off day. Maybe you didn't sleep and you got into a bad argument with your spouse or something happened with your kid or you maybe you lost a loved one and it kind of messed with your psyche a little bit and your ability to perform at work. So with that being said, I think it's fair when you analyze those three fights to give the benefit of the doubt. I'm not saying this is what happened. I'm saying you can give the benefit of the doubt that maybe that wasn't the best Charles Oliveira that fought Islam Makachev that night. Or maybe Volkanovski is just the best guy on the planet. <laughs> it had to be done. Um, but no, seriously, in all seriousness, I, I do think you have to look at those things, especially as a guy who's going to potentially fight them. You can look at Dariush. If I'm Dariush, I'm taking a close look at that Charles Oliveira fight, comparing Charles Oliveira's last two fights, and then looking at the fight with Volk and comparing Volk's last fight and Islam's last two fights and just trying to paint a picture and trying to get a, a, a better idea of where exactly Makachev's skill set is and I think it's super high but when you look at those things smaller guy not as great as a grappler bigger guy one of the best submission grapplers in the UFC to ever do it kind of gets thrown around and then submitted and ragdolled a bit in that second round versus a guy who's smaller comes up is not really a good grappler at all hangs in there lands some some big damage and 
gets a takedown in the end and finishes like that and defends all the submission attempts. So you you kind of have to do your homework and make sure you're giving yourself an honest picture of what you're about to get yourself into because that's how you win championships. I'm, I'm just telling you what I know from experience. That's what I do. I can only tell you what I do that works for me. And if there's any free game that I can give you guys, is that's how you got to do your home. You got to analyze the opponents that stepped in there. You got to analyze the, how they were, their demeanor, um, the techniques that they use. How was their, how was they, like, they're moving their body language. Things like that is all super important when you're breaking down fights. If you want to figure out who is who. And then when you get the best versions, you always train for the best version of that person to show up. So that you make sure you left no stones unturned so you can give yourself the best opportunity and chance to get your hand raised. Mic drop. Um, other than that, we're going to wrap this up in a bit. Uh, predictions for Connor versus Chandler on tough. Guys, this is one thing I have to disclose. I saw some article. I think it was an article or text, whatever it is. Connor McGregor pulls up to the tough house or to the apex, wherever, where they're filming. And pretty much brings three of his guys. And they pick out three guys who are already in the house um, who are going to compete and tell them, you're out, my guys are in. And honestly, I feel like that was super crappy for the guys who had their hopes set on getting another opportunity to fight for the UFC or getting the opportunity to get into the UFC and now having that stripped away from them. Um, really shitty um change of events. I understand though for Connor is like you you come with the package, you come with the list of demands. So for his guys is great. Really cool to see that happen for them. So, you know, no hate for those guys. Like you guys do what you had to do. You got to worry about yourself. You're number 1. But I just feel gutted for those guys who were looking forward to this opportunity and had it stripped away um by one of the coaches. You know, that kind of sucks. So, um definitely empathize with those guys those guys and it's a shitty situation, but other than that, I'm looking forward to this fight against Chandler versus Connor. Again, I think Chandler has all the tools in the world to become a UFC champion, but he has to put together his fight IQ and figure out, does he want to be the entertainer or does he want to win, make even more money by becoming the champ and getting those pay-per-view points. And again, I don't know if he has a special contract where he is getting pay-per-view points already. He might already get that, and it's probably why he doesn't care. But if he doesn't, go out there and get the belt because at the end of the day, that's a legacy that they can never take away from you. Yeah, they can never take away that you are one of the most entertaining guys ever, but how many more fights can you do keep putting your your brain cells on the line? Let's call it what it is. You're putting your brain cells on the line. You're taking time away that could be spent with your kids and your family um, just to go out there and entertain. And you're like, yes, that's part of the job. But your job is also to come back home a winner as much and as often as you can. And uh, I think when you look at it like that, you, you kind of get things put in a bit more of a perspective outlook for you. And... Um, in, a, in the positive fashion. I mean, I guess it depends on your perspective. Glass half full, right? If Chandler's goal is, I want to make as much money as possible just by entertaining, hey, that's cool. But if you want to be remembered as one of the best guys to ever do it, not the guy who's just, ah, oh, he was so good. Like, you don't want people telling stories about you around the fire pit. Yeah, that Michael Chandler guy was so damn good. You know, he could have been this, that, maybe even a, two, a two-weight champ, but he just wouldn't get out of his own way. He just ah, he just liked to put on entertaining fights and he would just go crazy and just do crazy stuff, fighting with his hands down, had so much heart. He's so tough. If that's the story you want, if that's the campfire story you want to tell people for the next few generations, that's cool. It's all perspective. But at the end of the day, I feel like as a guy who wrestled, you you have a hunger to want to stand on top of the podium because that's why we wrestle. We always want to be the NC double-A champion. And when you come up short with that and you have another opportunity, I know that hunger is still in the back of your mind. Like, I know I can be if I just do things the right way. I'm not saying go out there and be boring, but I am saying use your MMA skill set. Use everything. Use your grappling. Use your striking. Be entertaining, but mix in the wrestling when you have to. Circle when you need to. Put your hands up. Put your hands down when appropriate. If you want to showboat, do some gamesmanship. Cool. But there's a place and time for everything, depending on your perspective and what you want out of this few more fights that you have for your career. I'm looking forward to this fight. I think Connor has 
the stylistic build to win with the kicks. Can he bring back the kicks? Is he still as hungry? Is he going to be doing the spinning wheel kicks? Is he going to come out leading with that southpaw, coming with the feints, stepping in with the teeps, those snapping teep kicks? Not teeps, front kicks. Where it's not like a push kick, he snaps it with the toe and tries to dig it into the solar plex or the liver if he can. Have somebody do that to you, and I guarantee you're going to be like, that suck. And then he'll come with the head kick and then come back with a spinning back wheel kick. So that type of Connor who comes back, has his gas tank in order, that's a dangerous guy. But then you have a guy like Chandler who can hit like Iron Mike Tyson and at the same time wrestle his ass off if needed. It depends on who shows up. I think Connor's coming here to win because this is a tailor-made matchup with the, the shows that Michael Chandler has showed us in the past. If that Chandler shows up, this is Connor's fight to lose. But if a Chandler comes in game ready, showing that I want to be an actual threat to the throne and really win and not just make a red panty night payday, I think he goes out there and gets it done over Conor McGregor. This is a very fascinating fight. I'm looking forward to it. The return of Conor McGregor. Anyone who said they're not excited to see my Conor McGregor fight is, is a hater, man. Let's call it what it is. He's one of the most <sighs> polarizing people out there. Athletes to ever do it. Even on his losing streak. He's still Conor McGregor. I'm going to always tune in. Until he's like maybe like 50 years old. He's still fine. I'm like, all right, guy. It's time, it's time to hang it up. I think we should walk away from this now. You know what I mean? But for now, I'm still very much interested in watching Conor McGregor. Seeing how much he's shrunk from getting back in a testing pool, seeing if his cardio is going to hold up, seeing how strong he's going to be. Will he have the same pop that he's had at 45 when he was starching, guys? Uh, very, very interesting situation, and I'm looking forward to it. Can't wait. Um, so make sure you guys tune in. And other than that, guys, if you like my shirt, the luckiest funk master of all time, go to my website, aljermainstern.com, and go cop official merch from me. Proceeds go to myself. Um, gives me an opportunity to reinvest into my company. Uh, so thank you guys. I appreciate you. As always, if you like my shit, subscribe to my shit or spin it back, fish, baby. Oh yeah, go listen to the song, Go Stupid O. I said Go Stupid O. It's called Go Dumb. I don't even know the name of my own damn song. It's called Go Dumb on all streaming platforms, iTunes, Spotify, all that good stuff. Go check it out. Go Dumb featuring my brother, Troy Grimes. Um, love you guys. Stay safe. God bless. Peace.